Hello and welcome to Alan History Nerd. In this video we're going to be looking at Soviet society under Lenin and Stalin and we're going to be looking at this period 1917 to 1941. Uh, this is part of my series on Tsarist and Communist Russia which goes all the way from the 1850s through uh, to the 1960s and is designed to help A-level students uh, studying Tsarist and Communist Russia. So this video is going to look at society under uh, Lenin and Stalin and in this we're going to see some rather dramatic and traumatic changes and some massive impact. A lot of it is pretty grim but we're going to be trying to assess as we go through how the policies of Lenin and Stalin impacted on the different groups in society and how things changed. Now, to start off with, we're going to deal with different groups within society. And the first of these groups we're going to look at is the upper and middle classes. Now, as you would expect, we're following a communist revolution. The position of this group in society is not going to be ideal. So we're going to, to, to look at what happens to them. I will apologise as we go through about any of my, of my attempts to pronounce Russian words, which I know is shocking, but I, I will try my best. So in 1917, um, the, the communists started attacking the, the uh, bourgeois, the aristocrats, the landowners, the priests, the businessmen, the lawyers, and even doctors. Uh, and essentially what they were referring to was anybody who was well-dressed. And if you were a member of these kind of middle or upper classes and you were being at risk of being denounced as being bourgeois as being bourgeois and Lenin encouraged hostility towards these group of people as class enemies and actually for in a lot of ways it's provided a bit of distraction for uh, for the, um, the the Bolsheviks to keep the kind of the peasantry and and, and the workers happy in that in that they they it gave them a focus so rather than focusing on what was going wrong with it with, with various parts of, of 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 government and the war and everything following uh, the revolution it, it got them to to focus on these people and and they could be the focus of dislike. Uh, and uh, Lenin formalised all the policies against this group, calling them former people. Uh, their houses were taken off them, the, uh, and, and these ha big houses were then turned into communal apartments for the workers. So there was something, again, the workers would gain from this. Um, they were they were forced to carry out menial tasks, uh, and some of this might include things like uh, cleaning the streets. And so again, there was a sense amongst some of the the, the, the working classes that they they could see this group getting their comeuppance, and again, they seemed to 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 fit with the ideas that were being sold to them in the in the revolution. Um, a number of the, these former nobles and bourgeoisie were assaulted. They were they were robbed and even killed. There's the the, the stories are, are of um, the women from the bourgeoisie having to um, to to enter things like prostitution to to kind of survive because uh, they um, particularly during the civil war they were barely giving enough enough to survive on and and they they to start off with they sold all their possessions then eventually they were left with nothing so the plight of, of this group in society uh, was was really really grim right from the beginning um now things did improve in in, in kind of a temporary way in in the during the new economic policy uh, the neep men and and the bourgeois specialists uh, would would kind of put back into into positions of power and authority really within um, various parts of business and, and, and industry but really they were they were being tolerated rather than the, than being celebrated and and the bourgeois way of life was still kind of denounced by communist propaganda and, and anybody showing any bourgeois traits and, and, and kind of ambition in these in these kind of ways was seen as being decadent and selfish and greedy and, and this this temporary kind of um, mitigating of some of the problems early on was and again it was temporary there's a great turn in 28 29 when we moved to five-year plans and collectivization marks a, a kind of a big downturn in in, in the prospects anybody who'd really benefited under the NEP so the neat men and, and the specialists and then in particular in the countryside the kulaks were the ones who who, who felt the brunt of Stalinist policy as things changed and anybody again potentially a bourgeois background and the people who became who were managers and specialists they these these were the groups who who faced the greatest danger really and under stalin's terror 
uh, and definitely in the countryside, any the, anyone who was seen as being wealthy or better off, a kulak, um, w was likely to to face the the full wrath of the terror. Now, <laughs> the next we're going to look at is is the working class. Now, of course, it really should be a, a very different story here. It should be, again a very negative story about what happened to the middle and upper classes. But in, in a way, again, given the ideology of what the the the, the um, Bolsheviks were saying, then really the the, the, the bourgeoisie they are class enemies. They're going to be badly treated. But the workers, the proletariat, they they are the the class, the group that the whole ideology is based around. So surely things would be much better for them. But it's not quite that straightforward. I mean, Lenin issues his degree on workers' um, control, which gave workers the right to control of the, the means of production and, uh, and um, financing. It gave them the, the right to supervise the management and to kind of turn the tables about how things have been run before. In theory, this sounded great. I mean, really, Lenin was, was just accepting the reality of what was going on. He didn't. It, it, the, the workers seizing control of the factories happened first, and then Lenin issued a degree say, decree saying it was OK. So it's, it's, it's not really cause and effect with Lenin causing it. And, and what ensued was it was generally chaotic. Um, the workers gave themselves uh, massive pay rises and longer holidays and shorter working days. And, and this didn't do great things for industry. They also um, they, they also took things from the factories. Um, there's examples of them, them um, cutting uh, out of um, taking bits out of machines and using using them at home and all kinds of all kinds of things like that, using using parts of machines for the, the to to reinforce the soles of their shoes. I mean, the the, the discipline of everything completely collapsed. And not in all cases. I mean, and there was stuff that continued going. Industry didn't stop completely, but it, it wasn't running very smoothly. And and they needed industry to be working during the Civil War. So they restored discipline in the factories through managers and harsh, harsh uh, regulations. Uh, internal passports were introduced to prevent workers leaving the cities and returning to the countryside or moving to another city. Uh, the trade unions were used, again, you think it would be a cornerstone of the working classes and, and, and supported by groups like the Bolsheviks. Well, they were brought under state control. And, and it's not surprising, therefore, that by, by the end of the Civil War in 21, there was significant protests amongst some of the workers, including what became known as the Workers' Opposition faction within the, uh, faction within the Communist Party itself against the authoritarian nature of the regime. Even during the NEP, workers' lives didn't really improve very much. I mean, heavy industry, such as coal, iron and steel, they all remained under um, government control. And so not a huge amount changed there. Um, where any area that, that was um, was put under private control, the manager had therefore to break, had to break even. So they kept wages under control. They laid off staff um, to keep costs down. Um, and so there was discontent amongst the workers here because, again, they were in a weak position um, in consumer based industries. Again, we, we changed this move move for private uh, uh, for profit. So we've got state under run industry, which has to um, to break even. We've got private industry that has to make money and all of this puts a downward pressure uh, on wages and, and creates unemployment. Um, so the, the workers referred to the new economic policy as the new exploitation of the proletariat, which again suggests the Bolsheviks weren't doing a great job here of improving the lives of the workers. Now, under Stalin, we, we see this period uh, known as the Great Turn in 28, when we see them move to five year plans and collectivization. Uh, and th this was seen as, as a big stepping stone towards cre creating this uh, classless society that Marx had envisaged. And Soviet propaganda pushed this idea of the new Soviet man, who was somebody who was totally committed to, to the creation of a true socialist Russia and would sacrifice all their individual needs, needs for the greater good, for the, the whole of community. Uh, and social responsibility was seen as a, a, a key moral virtue and was the, the main characteristics of this this new group of citizens that were going to emerge. So again, the, the workers are are the are the absolute central part of, of the whole ideology under Stalin. Now there were thousands of young communists who were passionately committed to the five year plans. They were very enthusiastically uh, participating in the build, building of, of new industry, even building new towns and cities. 
and, and they, they, they were they were kind of wrapped up in this propaganda of this glorious so, socialist future they were looking, working towards this kind of utopian society that was going to be created and everything was going to get get better now educational opportunities were in, improving there was a quota system introduced to so ensure that a certain percentage of, of working class uh, students got into university um, and social mobility improved so you started to see people moving from being an ordinary worker to becoming a manager so so we, we're seeing again move towards the, the, this kind of new society and and the group that are probably most famous in all of this are the Sakonovite movement and and they they were an inspiration and they they inspired other workers they they became heroes of Soviet labor um, and they what they did is they did incredible feats. So, uh, this came from a miner who 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 broke all records in the amount of coal that he managed to to cut in a in a single shift. And, and then there was all across all industries and and parts of work there were more and more examples of this. And, and the Stakhanovites got got higher wages and they got greater rewards. And from thirty one they started to to inspire some workers, but it also used to cause some resentment and um, by by the end of the 1930s the, the differential between the highest and lowest paid worker was bigger than the differential between the highest and lowest paid worker in america and again this didn't seem to particularly fit with soviet ideology with communist ideas this idea of everybody everybody getting the same well the, the stack on are not getting the same and so they decided to be um resented by their colleagues in, in partly because they had better working living conditions and more stuff and, and partly because um their exploits were used as justification to to increase the labor norms so the love daily day levels production so people go well look this guy's smashing these records and you what are you doing right we're going to increase how much you have to produce every day by 10 percent and and that became that, that became fairly standard by 36 and again if you imagine in clash if you you there's that um that student who uh, does the extra essays and um, reminds the teacher when the homework's set and all those kind of things and everybody else might kind of go start to resent that a little bit I'm sure you don't but that that kind of idea that the you've got these people who are really pushing it and not only are they gain benefit themselves but they're actually making other people's lives more difficult now the the conditions for the workers and we 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 saw some stuff under Lenin didn't we in terms of these grand kind of buildings and apartments being taken off the work the middle and upper classes and and divided amongst the workers well living conditions for these workers was not great they they lived in cramped uh, cramped conditions sanitation was limited but, um, basic supplies of water and things like that were unpredictable and, and particularly during the first five year plan there was almost no consumer goods produced so so they, they things were improving in terms of russia's industrial output but people weren't really seeing an enormous amount of benefits of it um but in the second five year plan that there started to be greater in, uh, production of consumer goods uh, rationing was abolished um but this prices stayed high standard of living improved only a little bit and the fact that the the third five year plan became fo focused completely on defense meant that that living standards started to go down again so this these stepping stones towards this socialist utopia which you could start to see a little bit of progress before then fell away as, as everything turned into preparation for war there was a new hierarchy amongst the workers as well and and, and hierarchy now was dependent um not on, on the initial class but on on a membership of the communist party and if you were a member of the party in which you worked through the party, then this, in, this entitles you to better housing, higher rations and ordinary citizens. And, and the lifestyle of senior communists turned out to be really rather comfortable and, and in a stark contrast to, to the ordinary workers. So again, we, we've still got inequality, but it's an inequality based on, on party membership rather than anything else. And not huge numbers of people were party members i think this is quite a surprising thing about this you you think well everybody must have everyone would have immediately joined the party because there was benefits to doing it but actually under 10 percent of the population were members of the party um and 
Now, this elite became increasingly self-serving. They, they kind of closed themselves off from the rest of the population. And, and they actually started making, putting barriers in the way into actually joining the party. Again, you would have thought they'd have wanted everybody to join, but you had to be nominated by an existing member. Uh, and then you had to serve a, a trial period to your super suitability and that you were fully committed and all those kind of things. And so you, you kind of got the, the carrot, come and join the party and, you, there'll be, and, and there'll be better things for you. But there was also the stick and the stick was a massive thing under Stalin. So they, there was this huge fear of, of punishment because you've got the whole era of terror. And terror became a major part of, of everyday life in the USSR in the 30s. Uh, and... It encouraged people to work hard, so there were it continued to be incredible feats in, in, in industrial production. But that, a lot of that was because people were terrified and they knew of the terrible circumstances if they failed to meet their targets. Um, so it, it was a, a kind of very, very kind of strong reality of a daily worry for people in Soviet Russia and under Stalin. In Sta under Stalinism, was that you you had to do what you we're expected to do, otherwise the consequences could be really, really bad. Now, a group that Marx's ideology doesn't really focus on a huge amount, in fact, it kind of largely ignores them, is the peasantry. But this is not something the Bolsheviks can afford to do because it's 80 odd percent of the population. So they had to they had to kind of work out what they were going to do with the peasantry and how they were going to to move things forward, fitting with uh, trying to fit with communist ideology as best they could. Now, when the Bolsheviks seized powers, uh, the the peasantry used this as as, as a um, a reason to be able to go and seize themselves a load of land. Now, the Bolsheviks had no way of controlling the countryside. They were very weak in the countryside, particularly early on. Now, Lenin issued the land decree that declared that all the land in Russia belonged to the people, and the people themselves could decide how it was divided up. Which essentially, again, this was after the whole the horse had bolted. So he was saying, yes, go take yourself some land after the peasants had got out and taken themselves some land. Uh, and then the peasantry don't have a great time during uh, the civil war because they have grain taken off them by both sides. Uh, and they they even formed the, the green armies it, 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 with the social revolution. It's largely to defend their own farms. Uh, and the Bolsheviks became massively resented because of their role in grain, uh, grain requisition. And during the war, the civil war, the, the um, agricultural production just kind of broke down uh, and, and war communism didn't work, which then led to the MEP. Now, this benefited the peasants far more than it did anybody else because it was absolutely based on the idea that they had to get food produced in Russia. Uh, and this this improved the standard of living of, of the peasantry. They they were encouraged to grow surplus and to sell it in the open market and therefore generate uh, profit. And this brought apparent improvements under their, their lives. But they, there remained tension between them and the communist government because what the peasants were doing didn't fit really with communist ideology. And, and because of their experiences during the civil war, the peasantry didn't trust the Bolshevik government. And this resentment was made worse by the high levels of taxation and the, the peasant side to organise themselves. We see peasants unions, we see uh, peasants representatives being elected into local Soviets. And the, the secret police reported that there was, it was a great deal of complaint amongst the peasantry about how everything was going. Now, this tension, together with the procurement crisis, again, there was a shortage of, of food, 27-28, uh, led to the introduction of collectivization under Stalin. And, and this, again, completely transformed the, the peasants' lives and their relationship with the state as, as peasants who'd done well under the previous um, policies of the NEP were declared as to be kulaks and were now being treated as enemies of the state. And the numbers of peasants who either died or, or, or were forcibly relocated during collectivization is in is in the millions. Um, so and we see mass starvation and we see horrendous, horrendous atrocities in, in the countryside across the Soviet Union, in particular in areas like Ukraine. Now, the collective farms weren't producing the food levels that they did. There was a lack of motivation for the for the peasants working in them. So one of the things that the, the Communist Party did on Stalin is, is to try and alleviate this is as, a, as long as working on the collective farm, the peasants were allowed to have their own private plots where they could keep animals and grow vegetables and things like that. Now, these actually produced a hugely disproportionate level 
of the food, of food in the USSR. So again, through this, the peasants still found a way of making um, their own money on the side, and and essentially the communist government had to accept this because otherwise there wasn't enough food. Now the next bit we're going to look at is is women under uh, the the Communist Party, and and again there was some interesting stuff in this, and there's, there's some of this is kind of almost ahead of its time in, in comparison um, to the West, and we see some some massive sweeping changes, and we'll see pro progress in one direction under Lenin, and we see a lot of that uh, reversed under Stalin. So equality uh, between the sexes is a key part of of uh, Marxist teaching. And the Bolshevik government under Lenin introduced measures to improve the lives of women. They were now allowed to own property. Um, uh, sex discrimination became illegal. Divorce um, was made easier. Now, the, the, the theory of this was that it would free women from the control of their husbands uh, and, and this idea that women had been oppressed uh, and, and, and that this could be uh, removed. Uh, abortion was legalised and made available on demand. Um, Lenin also said that he would provide creches and nurseries in order to enable people to go, women to go out and work. Uh, the Communist Party set up a women's branch of the Central Committee to promote the position of women in society. Uh, and propaganda, propaganda from, uh, from the Communist Party sold the vision of men and women as equal, working towards the goal of building a socialist paradise. So you can you can see in all of this, and, and arguably very much the case, that there is a transformative um, change in the role of women under Lenin and, and the Bolsheviks. However, things are not as quite as positive as they would first seem. So first of all, women faced the problem of dual burden. So yes, they could go out and work, and they had to go out and work, but that didn't mean that all the way of... Um, the family life didn't still fall on them and so they essentially were being full-time housewives and full-time workers at the same time. Although there was great propaganda promises of, of loads of crashes and nurseries, the number that Lenin promised compared to the number that were actually built it does, doesn't work. There were very few of them actually built. Um, women continued to be paid significantly less than men. Um, Easier access to divorce was actually sometimes to the detriment of women rather than in their favour, and actually 70% of, of divorces were initiated by men. Um, so it, it, far from from freeing uh, women from the oppression of, of their husbands, actually what it, it tended to lead to it was women being abandoned by their husbands. Uh, and some some of the stuff is quite is quite startling actually. I mean, and it's, it's real shows of societal change. So in, in 1927, two thirds of marriages ended in divorce, um, and there's lots of horrendous things like domestic violence and rape were common, really common crimes at this point. Um, there was rising levels of unemployment, and that tended to affect women more than men. And when they lost their jobs, that 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 wage was vital to supporting their their family. So, although there had been some transformative change, which was viewed as being massively positive, the, a lot of the reality for women um, was was pretty grim. When we then move on to Stalin, we we, we see things um, reversing actually. So the women's section of the Central Committee was shut down. Um, Stalin declared that that women's issues had been solved, which of course they hadn't. Um, many peasant uh, women were being abandoned by their husbands who left to seek work in the industrial towns and cities and simply just left them behind. Um, the continuation of the pay gap, um, again, not something unique to, to Stalinist Russia by any means, but um, it, on average women earned 40% less than men. Uh, promotion was much harder for women than it was for men. There, was, there were some positives for women under Stalin, so for example, uh, the expansion of higher education provided new opportunities for women. Uh, in 1929, 20% uh, of higher education places were, were, were reserved for women. It, it's a fairly modest increase in the 14% who were, who already were going, but but it, by 1940, 40% of engineering students were female. Women gained a, a higher percentage of job in expanding areas such as healthcare and education. And education really did um, take off at this period in time. And so there was there was an increasing provision of crashes and nurseries during the 1930s, uh, and this helped women to an extent balance domestic duties and work. But 
domestic duties were were very much seen as the woman's responsibility and the idea of traditional womanhood and and and, and child rearing and looking after, after the home were very much promoted by um, Stalinist propaganda. And that was because Stalin would become really concerned about family breakdowns. And we, we, we saw uh, a few minutes ago just the enormous rates in, 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 in Russia at this time, in Moscow, in 27 was two thirds of marriages. And this was then leading to falling birth rates, we got high levels of abortion as well. Um, and there was a, a kind of policies and things put in place to try and stop this. A, ma a man seeking a divorce would have to contribute 60% of their income to child support. Um, abortion, which had been made legal on demand, was now outlawed it, unless there was risk to the mother's life. Um, so free marriages, marriages that had not been formally registered the, the, with the state, had been given full legal status. They don't now, now lost that. Um, and the government started introducing rewards for mother heroines. Those who'd had 10 or more children were, were, were given this great honour by the state. Uh, male homosexuality was declared to be illegal. Um, the the idea of a family as a an unnecessary bourgeois concept, which is the original Marxist teaching and what has been kind of said under Lenin, was replaced by the view that the the family was a key building block of socialist society, and, and traditional softer female virtues were were kind of promoted, and 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 the idea of these strong muscular women associated uh, with with the earlier parts of propaganda kind of melded and melted away and, and were replaced by more traditional ideas of femininity and, and motherhood. And the, 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 what, what we've already talked about with the changing role of women also impacted um, on, on ideas of what happened with the youth. So education was a big thing and we, and we see this being recognised by Lenin and we've got this connection because uh, his wife uh, was the co uh, the commissar for education uh, in the Sobokum government, and free education was provided at all levels for the first time in Russian history. So again, we've got something that is really transformative in, in the lives of young people, and education is hugely significant and makes a massive it has a massive impact on people. And the curriculum was organised in a, a communist framework. So, so in schools, essentially, there was a high level of indoctrination. So um, students were to learn communist ideology, go on to go on visits to, to factories, industrial plants. They would get a Marxist view on history. They would they would get a Bolshevik view on on, on the development of Russia. Um, this was a little less restrictive um, during the period of the NEP when creativity and individuality and uh, of expression were kind of allowed and promoted. Um, though th this isn't long lasting. Um, there was a youth organisation, so a youth wing of the party was set up in, in 1918 uh, and this it, it significantly expanded in 26 and was uh, renamed uh, the Commissol. And it was divided into two bits, the Young Pioneers, which for, was for children aged 10 to 14, and the Commissar itself was for 14 to 28 year olds. And we're talking about youth. I mean, 28 kind of expands um, the idea of youth a bit, really, doesn't it? But um, there's a massive problem with this in, in that by, by the time uh, we get to 1928, only 6% of the eligible young people would actually join the Commissar. So it, this is an idea of promoting the party with like young people and giving the, 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 them the kind of party experience and, uh, and bring it all together. But if only 6% of the young people are joining, it's not going to be hugely effective. Now, in wider society, the, the, there's, the, there really is some really significant impacts of, of the policies that are going on under Lenin. So one of the things that happens, particularly with the change, changes um, to the role of women, is, is the traditional family unit collapsed, uh, particularly in, in some of the cities in Russia. Um, and the ease of divorce really did in, impact on a large number of people. There were millions who were either orphaned or abandoned. Um, and there's an estimate that we've got a number of about seven to nine million children. Who, who are essentially ending up in, being looked after by the state because they aren't being looked after um, by their families. 
And then we, we, we see, as soon as there is this relaxation, slightly in society and the NEP, we see an increase in levels of, uh, of drinking and gambling and prostitution amongst the old, older youth who, who were, uh, were earning wage. Now, we've seen this hooliganism. There was outrage amongst the older party members. And they viewed that this was evidence, again, that capitalist values are corrupting. And what was happening is the youth were being corrupted by capitalist ideas and therefore these capitalist ideas had to be get rid of and therefore and and then the the youth would behave in a more pure and socialist way and so we then go into this period which is often seen as a cultural revolution which is under Stalin it takes place 28 to 32 so there there was a push to remove capitalist individualism out of out of society and this this starts with taking it all out of, uh, of of education so any teacher who was considered to be bourgeois or not communist enough was sacked um we see uh, a return to textbooks and homework and exams and uniform and school discipline all these things have been and gone and 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 been hugely relaxed under the 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 earlier periods uh, and and they'd all been seen as part of the capitalist system and had been removed in many ideas um and and we we kind of see some of this stuff go but then we see extreme cases of stuff going on where we see the children in school being trained just to do a particular job so it was an area where there's lots of poultry farming then essentially all the school would do would train the local children to be poultry farmers and nothing else um there was a target that universities were to, to take more students that were from proletarian, back, proletarian backgrounds. This target got as high as 70%, though it was rarely achieved. Um, so we, we've seen this quite radical change in schools where, where a lot of the old ideas about how schools should be with the homework and exams and all that stuff kind of went in this cultural revolution where they're trying to get rid of all capitalist ideas, all this old stuff from the old world. We, we see the commissal playing an important role. Um, so the young communists, they would get more um, more indoctrination. They could then be motivated to attack anything considered to be bourgeois in terms of culture and any class enemies. So they would um, disrupt plays, vandalise art considered bourgeois. They, they attacked the church. They attacked churches and priests. Uh, and they would volunteer to go off and, and work in the new it, it, it industrial cities such as Magnigorsk and act as kind of shock workers, people and, and the, whose dedication was uh, was absolutely phenomenal. Others spoiled the collectivization drive. They went out into the countryside and started running these collective farms. Um, and they were they were the groups who would often would would be violent and com be confrontational with the with the Kulak groups that they that resisted. Now, one of the the examples of the kind of the impact this kind of stuff has it is the it is the story of, of Pavlik uh, Morozov, uh, and this is a 14 year old who testified against his own father, who was the chairman of the village Soviet, for associating with kulaks. Um, so Pavlik becomes a hero to the state because he's shown that he puts state ahead of. Uh, a state and party ahead of a family, but his family didn't see it in quite the same way. And Pavlik was murdered by his grandfather and cousin. Uh, Morozov is then he Pavlik he, he is recognised as a hero and a martyr, and there's, there were statues put up in his honour. Um, and the youth were encouraged to inform on anyone, teachers, family members, anybody at all who was guilty of um, anti-communist sentiment or bourgeois behaviour. Uh, and the Cultural Revolution started to get a bit out of control as you've got thousands and millions of people denouncing each other and this kind of fanaticism uh, developing. And in 32, Stalin signalled that, that the chaos and upheaval of this period was to be brought under tighter control. So that this education system was in chaos as a lot of, a lot of these old these ideas and norms had all been turned up and thrown out and, and what on earth was supposed to be going on and we see this with the commissal as well maybe some of the commissal groups are getting a bit fanatical and a bit out of control and it's all starting to fall apart a bit and so we then go into this next period where, where Stalin tries to to reassert things so we see the education law in 35 reasserted the discipline in schools and, and government direction over curriculum 
uniforms and exams were reintroduced. Um, uh, girls had to wear their hairs in pigtails. Uh, all kinds of kind of the rules that had all been thrown out during the Cultural Revolution as being bourgeois and out of date were now considered to be kind of endorsed by the state. Uh, the government controlled the content of textbooks. Um, it, communist ideology became a key, a key and compulsory subject, uh, and this was seen through higher education as well. Uh, the quota system for entry to higher education that had been introduced in, in 29 was abolished in 35. Uh, and and so we see a, a dip in the the, the level of the, the members of the, 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 the proletariat who are entering universities. Now youth organisations were growing. The Commonwealth by 1940 had over 10 million members. It provided significant um, support for the government's five-year plans. And the Commonwealth became a, a disciplined and structured part of the organisation. We have to remember it is different to other youth organisations because it goes up to the age of 28. Um, now, the young pioneers, so these are 10 to, to 14 year olds, got, got to go to work, go and do activities in community centres. They went on free holiday camps uh, and being a member of the young pioneers and the commissar brought better opportunity, greater opportunity at school. You were more likely um, to, to get into university and there was a prospect of full party membership in the future and we've already seen that the party membership was the, was the golden ticket that the party members lived much better lives than other people. Now there were of course those who didn't buy in they didn't want to live the, live the, the communist life they didn't want to, to join the commissar and they started to get interested in Western culture and ideas and, and ideas and music such as jazz. Uh, um, but although there was interest in this and, uh, and there might well be people sneaking illicit copies of jazz music and stuff in and listening to it, the, the communist propaganda and of course the terror was so strong that, that this didn't lead to huge amounts of opposition. And, and there were some positives in, in wider societies all well. in, in the improvements in education all the way through from 1918 going forward did increase significantly literacy rates, which is maybe not a surprise as there hadn't been kind of universal compulsory education before in Russia for, for, all, for everybody. There were greater opportunities for children from working in peasant families. Uh, and there were lots of examples of talented children from hum humble backgrounds going on to forging successful careers in a whole r whole wide range of areas. Uh, and we we saw at this point, and this is all going to then feed into um, what we see in World War Two, and then get into the Cold War. We 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 see the, this high level of high quality engineering and science graduates coming out through Russian universities. And, and Russia, which had been a backward nation, was not going to be one anymore. Another area that in society that, that Marxism and the, the, the Bolsheviks had a massive impact on was on religion. Now, Marxist ideology describes religion as the opium of the people. And, and what this he means by this, or meant by this, was it was a false belief that was used to convince the workers to be obedient, to obey the people in charge, and, and and the idea that it was everything was part of God's plan and God, it was God's will that they were at the bottom of society and other people at the top. And the Bolsheviks said, look, this is just wrong. They, the, 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 um, that you, you aren't in this place because of some great plan. And essentially, Bolshevism rejects religion. And the Bolsheviks were determined to reduce or remove completely the impact of organised religion on Russian people. Um, so the Russian Orthodox Church had been part, a key part of the state in Tsarist Russia. It's now declared to be separate in 1918. Huge amounts of church land was confiscated. Um, marriage became a civil institution rather than a religious one. Uh, religious education was banned in 1921. Uh, propaganda was directed against religion uh, and there was this this formation of the union of the militant godless of, and, uh, and that which promoted atheism. Um, so uh, Christmas and Easter were replaced by, uh, by a national 
uh, festivals of New Year and May Day. So we, again, we see a breaking of the, of the religious ca uh, calendar. Um, during the Civil War, uh, priests were deprived of rations and, and many died of starvation because of this. Uh, during the Civil War, church valuables were seized. Again, anything of value was taken. Uh, any um, priest or church leader who uttered any anti-communist ideas were arrested. And also we see um, the, the persecution of other faiths, such, of it, such as Muslims, it, and, and we see the, the property of mosques, etc., being, uh, being seized, uh, Shia courts were being abolished, uh, as Russia becomes a secular state. Now, again, things become um, more radical under Stalin. Uh, Commissar members were encouraged increasingly to, to harass members of the priesthood. We see desecration of the churches continuing and seizure of value, valuable objects from the churches. Um, by, in 1929, all congregations and their places of worship had to be registered with the government. So again, you were, you, if you want to go and follow religious services, you have to tell the government you're doing something that they don't really want you to do and be registered with them. Um, in 32, we see the introduction of the six day week to prevent holy day of worship. Um, the 36th constitution, the Stalin made any religious propaganda a criminal offence. Uh, for Muslims, pilgrimage to Mecca were banned in 35, wearing a, a, a Muslim veil was uh, forbidden as well. And during the Great Terror, 36 to 38, senior priests and bishops and, and members of the Russian Orthodox Church were arrested. And by 39, there were only 12 bishops. There had been 168 who were still, so only 12 of 168 were still at liberty. By 41, only one in 40 Orthodox churches were still operating. And the number of priests was down to 9% of its um, numbers in the 1920s. So we, we see a systematic here, kind of removal of the power of the church. Now, there will be a change to this, and the change is going to come um, during uh, the Second World War. But in, in the period going up to that, we really see uh, the communist state uh, riling against religion. Um, thank you very much uh, for watching. I hope that's been helpful for you. I am going to continue uh, doing videos going through this period on, on Lenin and Stalin and into um, the war period and then on to, to high Stalinism and Khrushchev and hopefully um, get the whole lot finished before um, those horrible exam things turn up. So thank you very much for watching. If you haven't done so already, then please do subscribe. Um, if you've liked the video, please hit like. Um, encourage others to watch it if they're studying the, this course or if they're just interested in, in this bit of, of history. And there's loads of other e eras of history, places, uh, history, American history, British history, um, are on the channel as well as a load of stuff for A-level politics as well. Thank you very much for watching.